This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on Him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we get started... This morning, we need to put into some application what uh, was emphasized in the Scripture reading and what we do every week in preparation for taking in the Word of God and the conclusion of our uh, communion service. We need to have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure that we are in fellowship, to make sure that there's no unconfessed sin in the life, to make sure that we are indeed prepared to study the Word because it is ultimately God the Holy Spirit at work in our lives who is the one who produces spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. And we cannot do it by ourselves. We can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Christianity is not a system of morality. It is uh, based on spirituality, right relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, who is the one who produces growth in our life. So Scripture says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we always begin with a few moments of silent prayer to give you the opportunity to make sure you're ready, and then I will open in prayer, and then we will look at God's Word. Let's pray. Father, it's a tremendous privilege that we have to be members of your royal family, to know that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, every one of us is indwelt, not only by God the Holy Spirit, but he has indeed made our bodies a temple for the indwelling of the Father and the Son, and and that it is through this positional sanctification that the foundation is laid, the basis is provided for our spiritual growth and spiritual advance. And that along with the Holy Spirit, who is our guide and our instructor and the one who produces growth in our lives, you've given us your precious word. And that it is that tool that the Holy Spirit uses to challenge us, to teach us, to correct us, and to move us forward in spiritual growth. Now, Father, as we dedicate this time to a study of your word, we pray that we might be able to focus, keep our minds from being distracted by the events that will come this afternoon or tomorrow or the worries and cares related to yesterday and that we might be able to focus fully on the instruction of your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Revelation chapter 3 and we're down to about verse 17. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. Just by way of review, Revelation 2 and 3 contain seven ecclesiastical evaluation reports. These EERs are designed to provide a base, basis for evaluation and judgment for these local congregations unless they listen to the warning that is given in five of the seven. This one in particular has a very serious warning that comes in verse 19, and the solution is given in verse 20, and we should get there uh, today. Begins in verse 14, to the angel, that is the recording angel, who is the court officer, who is the heavenly witness to what is going on in the church, in each of these churches. Each church has their own angel to be the recording angel related to the outworking of the justice of God uh, toward that congregation. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, says the Amen, 
the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. As I saw three titles emphasizing the stable character of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Amen emphasizes His deity. He is the eternally stable one. He is in His humanity the witness of God, and as a witness in, in the legal drama worked out in human history, He is the faithful and true witness. And He is the beginner of, Literally, the R.K., the beginner of the creation of God. He is not part of the creation. He is distinct from creation, as Colossians 1, 16 and 17 indicates. He is the one who created all things. Laodicea, as we pointed out, is located in the area known as the Roman province of Asia Minor, which was the uh, western part of, of what is now modern Turkey. It was located a few miles south of Hierapolis and a few miles to the uh, northwest of Colossae. There was one major problem we saw in Laodicea, and that was a problem related to water. Now we go through the commission and character of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then we come back and deal with the condemnation. And this condemnation, there's no commendation in this uh, letter as we have seen, only a condemnation. And this condemnation is built on an analogy related to the water problem. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I know your works, that is your production. And that word works includes both good and bad production. It involves sin, morality, as well as that which is, uh, has eternal value related to the production of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ intimately and exhaustively knows everything about every congregation in his omniscience. And he says to them, I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then... Because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is one of the harshest statements of criticism from the Lord Jesus Christ to believers recorded in the New Testament. And it clearly indicates that in contrast to uh, the, the approach and the view that a lot of people have of Jesus as always uh, loving and caring and somewhat uh, wimpy, that the Lord Jesus Christ is also a demanding leader of his church. As we saw earlier, the church's one foundation in the song is Jesus Christ, her Lord. He is the head, and he is taking us somewhere. And like a good leader, he has expectations of those who are in the body of Christ to go forward with him to grow to spiritual maturity. But these are believers in this congregation who have, like, they've gone beyond the Ephesian church. We read there that they left their first love. They have gone beyond the church at Pergamum and the third church at Thyatira that have gotten involved in false doctrine and heresy. They are living their life in completely within the framework of the world system. They are so dominated by the cultural thoughts and mores and standards of the surrounding pagan culture that they don't have anything related to Christ going on in the church. And the main message that is in this evaluation report is that there is no spiritual life. There is no production of anything of eternal value unless the believer has an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice I didn't say a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at the instant that you become a Christian, what you have done is you have believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And at that instant, you enter into an eternal relationship with God. You have eternal salvation that can never be taken away from you. At that instant, God does a vast number of things in your life that are part of that package that we receive, which we refer to as positional truth. These are our realities based on our position in Jesus Christ. But in addition to that, there are responsibilities that are laid upon us as members of God's royal family that if we are going to grow to maturity, there are principles that we need to put into practice in our own lives. But we can't do it on our own. It's not a matter of just 
uh, spiritual morality. It's not, I mean, just, it's not a matter of, of general morality. It is not a matter of just putting into practice certain ethical principles. It is a matter, as Jesus says in John 15, which we've studied recently, of abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ isn't positional. It is maintaining an ongoing, intimate, interactive relationship with Jesus Christ as the branch uh, on a grapevine uh, is tied into and abides in the main vine to receive its nourishment and its sustenance. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul uses the phrase walking by means of the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks about walking in the light, that you are in the light positionally, but now you need to walk as children of the light and not in darkness. All of these different metaphors reflect the means of spiritual life and spiritual growth. You can't do it on your own, but it's very easy to slip into some sort of self-sufficiency and self-reliance and think that you've got it licked and you can just handle these things on your own, and before long, it will destroy your spiritual life. And that's exactly what has happened here in the church of Laodicea. They have slipped into complete self-sufficiency. And as a result of that, they are operating not on divine viewpoint, but they are operating on human viewpoint. They have, uh, they have this veneer of religion. They know the terminology. They talk like Christians. They go to church, but they uh, are... Uh, they're not walking by the Holy Spirit. They're not abiding in Christ. And as a result, they are spiritually impoverished, even though due to the self-deception of arrogance, they think that they are uh, spiritually uh, rich. And so the Lord Jesus Christ says, as a result of that, you become lukewarm believers. Just another metaphor in Scripture, as we'll see, for believers that are operating on their own self-sufficiency and not on the basis, the spiritual basis of God the Holy Spirit for living the Christian life. They're not in right relationship with God. They're not abiding in Christ. They're not in right relationship with Christ. Christ has no part of this. That's where we end up in Revelation 3.20 is Christ has been virtually excluded from the life of this uh, congregation. So we've seen the pictures the last few weeks of the uh, remnants of the aqueducts that brought water into uh, Laodicea. Hot water was brought in from Heropolis. Cold water was brought in from Colossae. Here's the coal streams in Colossae and the streets of Heropolis. And, but the problem was that as this water arrived in Laodicea, it became lukewarm, and they had a reputation for this foul-tasting water that would make you sick. So the Lord Jesus Christ takes this physical reality and uses it as an analogy, as, a, as an image, to portray their spirituality. And he presents the condemnation further in verse 17, which explains just exactly what he means by being a lukewarm believer. He says, because you say, quote, I am rich, I have become wealthy. They were physically wealthy. They were, this was a, an, an area that was very wealthy. They had uh, tremendous wealth there from both the textile industry and because they, uh, it was an area where gold was refined and processed. It was a banking center, and the people there were wealthy. But he's taking, again, that physical reality and using that to picture the spiritual reality. They think they're wealthy spiritually. They say, we have it all. We don't need anything else. We have arrived. In other words, they are beginning, they're in a position where they are denying the sufficiency of the Scripture practically. Now, this is something that happens a lot of times, especially today in our culture. You have many people who, on the one hand, will affirm a doctrinal statement that says, I believe the Word of God is inerrant and infallible. And that means, and it's very rarely stated, but it is in our doctrinal statement, an inerrant and infallible scripture means that it is sufficient in every area. That means that it's enough. That means you don't need something else. That means whatever problems, 
whatever difficulties, whatever heartaches, whatever traumas that you're facing in life, the principles for handling that are found in the Word of God. And we talk about the fact that of of the sufficiency of Scripture, which is just an outworking and and a corollary to the principle that that uh, was that was recovered at the time of the Protestant Reformation, sola scriptura, only by the Scriptures. We don't add tradition. We don't need uh, modern psychology. You don't need motivational principles that are derived from people who have immersed themselves in all manner of streams of human viewpoint thinking. It is the Word of God and the Word of God alone that gives us the answers to the problems in life. That's what we mean when we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture and the sufficiency of Christ and the sufficiency of the cross and the sufficiency of grace is that God has given everything to us more than than enough, but they claim that they have it all apart from Christ. Christ, as we see in verse 20, is standing at the door knocking, saying, Let me into your spiritual life. Let me into your congregation. And they are saying, No, we have it all. And it's excluding Christ. And so the Lord condemns them and says, You claim that you have it all, and you don't recognize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. You think you have it all, but your spiritual life is a train wreck. It's wretched. It is distorted. You're living like an unbeliever. You are therefore miserable. There's no real joy, the kind of joy Jesus Christ promised for every believer, the kind of joy that is the product of God the Holy Spirit, where we read in Galatians 5, 21 and 22, for the fruit of the Spirit is first love, then joy. That should characterize the believer's joy. This this isn't just kind of an exuberant happiness. You know, there are a lot of people who are just sort of naturally happy in life, and they go around with a smile on their face, and they readily laugh. This isn't the, the joy we're talking about here. This is the joy that's the fruit of the Spirit is a contentment, a tranquility. It's related to peace. It is a it, it is a bedrock of joy because we know who we are. We know who Jesus Christ is, and that no matter what happens politically, no matter what happens militarily, no matter what happens in terms of our own personal finances, we have a real solid joy in life because we know that we have been saved forever. And, and they don't know that they don't have an ongoing relationship. So they're truly miserable. They're poor. They're poor spiritually. They're not wealthy. They are truly poor because they don't have an ongoing walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. As a result of that, living in carnality and walking in darkness, they're blind. And because they have rejected the provision, the grace provision of God to deal with the problems in their life, they are naked. They are exposed and vulnerable because of their failure to be abiding in Christ. They're operating on the five arrogant skills. We studied this before, so this is just a brief review there. Arrogant skills begin with self-absorption. Whenever you're operating on the sin nature, you're self-absorbed. It's all about you. Only in Christianity, when we're walking by the Spirit, do we realize it's not about me, it's not about my agenda, it's not about what I want in life, it's about what the Lord's plan is. And that, that is the beginning of real humility. But when we get out of fellowship, the focus shifts to me. And once that focus shifts to me, we begin to indulge that. And so we have self-indulgence. And as we indulge our emotions, as we indulge our sinful desires, whether they flow from asceticism and self-righteous morality or whether they flow from immorality, we indulge those things. Then we begin to justify that behavior and that way of life and say, well, everybody else does it. Or, or you know, you just have to understand that's the way I am, but we don't want to deal with the issues of our own sin nature. And that eventually leads to self-deception. In self-justification, we start creating our own reality about life and about our spiritual life rather than paying attention to the objective teaching of the Word of God as to way, the way things really are. So we begin to live in a 
false world of our own construction. We are indeed living in a form of idolatry that is self-deification. Now, it all doesn't have to always flow in this particular area. There's just an ongoing interrelationship and interactivity between these different elements. And it, it, it is terribly convicting to take the time just to think objectively in our own lives about how these things manifest themselves in our own lives in contrast to what to the problem solving devices and how God says we should live. And what this produces is a human self reliance that attacks the sufficiency of Christ, the sufficiency of grace, and the sufficiency of God's word. I can't begin to tell you how this how important this doctrine is and how it is ignored practically by so many today, theologians, seminaries, missionaries, everyday Christians. We come to church and we talk about the fact that we believe this. It's in our doctrinal statement. It's, it's something we affirm. It's a, a distinctive that we hold. And yet very few people, when they go home in the afternoon and start facing problems, the issues, the cares of life, recognize that, you know, the Bible really is the sufficient solution. And I need to think every time I have a crisis, I need to think in terms of what are the parallels that I find in the Word of God. How is this a parallel in the life of Abraham? Is there a parallel in the life of David? Is there a parallel in Peter? And how is it resolved biblically? What's the example? What are the promises? What are the principles that I need to apply? Because it doesn't mean that the problem is going to go away. But it does mean that I can endure in the midst of the testing and have joy. Combination of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 and James 1, 2 through 4. But we have to get serious about the fact that we still have this ugly thing called the sin nature in us that is driven by inherent lust patterns. We have uh, those lusts for recognition, for approval, for love. We have lust for all manner of different things. There's sex lust, there's pleasure lust, there's, uh, you could just go on and you could come up with your own list of the lusts that we have. These are the driving motivations in our sin nature. You know, this is a great tool to understand the sin nature, especially if you're a parent. Because as you watch your kids growing up, you're going to see reflected in them, unfortunately, uh, elements of your own sin nature. And that's why if these are your biological kids, you're going to have some uh, great advantages as a parent because you're going to see where they're going a long time before they do. And perhaps you can head it off with some proper discipline. But we all have these lust patterns, and they tend to trend in different directions and maybe even in different uh, areas of our life. We have uh, the sin nature produces works in two areas. The upper area is we call it the area of strength because that's where we're, we, we are uh, not yielding to the sinful aspect. This is where we produce morality. And there's some people who have a high ethical standard. It's a result of their upbringing. It's a result of their culture, their background, but they may not be a believer. They may be uh, involved in some kind of religion that's very uh, strong in ethical standards, but all of this is still a product of the sin nature. Because remember, until the day you trust Christ as your Savior, you can only do that which comes from the sin nature. Everything you did up to the day you you were saved came from only one nature. You didn't have another nature. So it could only come from your sin nature. All those good works, Scripture says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's talking about the production of the area of strength. Then we have the personal sins, the area of weakness. This is where we're prone to the sins of the mental attitude, sins of worry and fear and resentment and bitterness and anger and hostility. Uh, Produces sins of the tongue where we run down other people through slander and through maligning and gossip, and these kinds of things. Uh, The lust tends to uh, trend in two directions, as I said earlier. Uh, One is toward asceticism and legalism. And this produces a moral degeneracy like the Pharisees at the time of Christ. They were very moral, very religious, but they were degenerates morally and spiritually. 
And this usually connects to the area of strength in terms of the human good, and it feeds off of each other. They're not so, uh, 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 they don't trend towards the overt sins, although it usually comes out that way. They're more hidden. Uh, they're mental attitude sins of, of arrogance and pride. Or we can trend in the other direction in terms of licentiousness, lasciviousness, and antinomianism, a rejection of authority. We're going to do it our own way. We're going to do whatever we want to do. And this tends to promote personal sins and immoral degeneracy. And when the believer is not walking by the Spirit, he's going to be walking by the flesh or the sin nature. And the results are going to be what Paul describes in Galatians 5, uh, 19 through uh, 21, I believe it is. The works of the flesh are evident, and it produces uh, immorality and uh, perversion and divisiveness and anger and strife and bitterness. And so when you see where those things are going on, you know that despite whatever anybody says, if you've got anger and strife and division and bitterness, that, that people are walking by the sin nature. If that's going on in, in a marriage or in a corporation or in a church, the first clue is people are walking by the sin nature. They're not walking by the Holy Spirit, and that's the source of the problem. And there can only be uh, one r- true and genuine solution. But when a believer quits walking by the flesh, he's, I mean, walking by the Spirit, He'll walk by the flesh, and the longer he walks by the flesh, the more the sin nature's uh, modus operandi becomes ingrained in him, and the more he attracts like a magnet the thinking of the world. See, the Bible talks about the fact that spiritually we have three enemies. Those three enemies are called the world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh is our sin nature. That's the enemy within The world is the cosmic system. The term worldliness comes from the Greek word cosmos, so we refer to it as the cosmic system. And this is the cultural ideals of the society around us. And some societies over uh, the course of history are more influenced by biblical values. Others are less influenced by biblical values. But no culture is purely biblical. And the, every culture produces its own value system, its own sense of right and wrong, its own sense of what is important and what is not important. And every cultural system influences everybody that's born into it. And there are differences, different worldviews. If you're born in Europe, you're going to look at life a, a certain way that's going to be different from someone who's born in the United States. If you're born uh, in poverty in Central America, you're uh, the, the, the worldliness that affects you is going to be different from that which affects uh, someone who's born on uh, up in like Fifth Avenue in New York. If you're born in India or in China, you're going to have a different uh, worldview. The, the, the cosmic system around you is going to be have different values, different emphases. But the sin nature that's inside of us is attracted to that world system because the philosophies of the world provide the rationales to justify the sins and the activities of the sin nature. And so when we look at a congregation like that at Laodicea, what's happened is that they've taken the values of the pagan society around them, and that's part and parcel of who they are. And they have not grown as believers. They have not exchanged divine viewpoint for this human viewpoint. And they continue to live just like the pagans around. There's no difference. You could go to that church and feel very comfortable because they had had assimilated with the system around them and there was no challenge to walk by the Holy Spirit or to abide in Christ. And so their values are all uh, distorted. So we get into the doctrine of the lukewarm believer. And I have several points here that we need to go through this morning. First of all, the lukewarm believer is a complacent believer. He is complacent towards doctrine. It is not a priority in his life. It is not the priority in his life. And let me tell you, if you're a baby believer, if you haven't grown very much, you need to get to the point where you recognize that there is no life apart from doctrine. There's no life apart from doctrine. You were saved. You were bought with a price, the Scripture says. 
for a purpose, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, for good works prepared before time began. We are created in Christ for the purpose of serving God, and that is our priority. And until you get to that point in in, in maturity, there will always be a level of conflict, a tug of war in your soul, because the Holy Spirit is trying to push you in one direction, and yet you are being pulled by your sin nature in a different direction. And that's characteristic of spiritual childhood, learning to get to that point where we recognize, yes, Lord, doctrine's got to be number one in my life. So the lukewarm believer has become complacent towards doctrine. He's living according to the flesh, walking by the flesh, and his thinking is shaped by the worldview of the culture around him. He is a cosmic believer. This is what's happened in verse, we see this because of the solution in verse 20, where Jesus is outside the congregation. He's saying, behold, I stand at the door, knock if anybody will let me in. They're not letting him in. They're doing it all on their own. The shorthand for this is given us in, uh, 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 or, or an explanation of this kind of thinking is found in James three fourteen through 16. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, what is that? Self-seeking in your hearts. That's just self, another way of expressing self-absorption in the arrogant skills. If you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. See, you're in a position that is completely uh, a contrary to the truth of God's Word. And then James says that this wisdom, that is this, this human viewpoint wisdom that, that nurtures bitterness and resentment and vindictiveness, that this wisdom isn't from above. In fact, he characterizes it with three terms. It's first of all, it's earthly, second, it's sensual, and and third, demonic. Now, that's a poor translation in the uh, New King James. It is earthly, that is, it's related to earth dwellers who don't have a, a relationship with God. Second, it's not really sensual, that's that Greek word sukikos, soulish. It refers to the unbeliever. It's the kind of thinking that characterizes an unbeliever. It's sukikos, soulish. Just like uh, the word that's used there in 1 Corinthians 2.14 for the natural man. Uh, It's really neither natural nor sensual. It is the person who is not regenerate. So it's acting like an unbeliever. And third, it's demonic. Now, why is it demonic? Does it mean that a person who's like this way is demon-possessed? No, but they're demon-influenced. They're operating on the same kind of thinking that characterize the demons in Satan. And that's what? Autonomy, self-sufficiency. Lord, let me do it my way. I'm rejecting your authority, and I'm going to do it my own way. So human viewpoint thinking is that wisdom that is characteristic of creatures who are trying to do it all apart from God, self-sufficiency. And then James says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. See, when you start operating on the sin nature and when the congregation starts operating on the sin nature, eventually it works itself out into the most egregious of sins. And that is a lukewarm believer. A lukewarm believer is a believer who is not merely out of fellowship, but one who has turned his back on the grace provision of God for living the spiritual life. You see, we go through certain stages of carnality. We all go through the first stage of carnality daily, sometimes many times daily. We get out of fellowship. We just sin. We, we get angry or we're reminded of something and there's that flash of bitterness or jealousy or whatever it may be. But we all have that, those time periods when we sin and we get out of fellowship. But the solution is to confess our sins, to uh, be restored to fellowship. And we need to keep short accounts. But if we don't keep short accounts, then what happens is we have that process of walking by the flesh. It's called fleshly or carnal in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And if we continue to walk by the flesh as our standard procedure day after day after day after day, then we get described by these harsh categories we find in the Scripture, fallen from grace, uh, lukewarm, uh, worldly, 
All of these indicate believers who are walking like an unbeliever, walking in darkness, and their life is no different from the life of anybody else, and their Christianity isn't doing them any good whatsoever. So fourth, they end up being believers who give lip service to doctrine, but they are in, enmeshed in religion, morality, if they're, going, if they're going to church. If they're not involved in a church, then they end up giving themselves over to uh, licentiousness and sin and various other other categories. But in the context, we're talking about the church at Laodicea. They're uh, mired in religion. They're just going through the motions. Uh, as Paul says in Second Timothy, they're holding to a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it, which is the Holy Spirit. So the cosmic believer then, point number five, the cosmic believer operates on human viewpoint systems of knowledge. He is an epistemological rebel. He's a rationalist or an empiricist or a mystic. And he uh, always uh, justifies his actions by appealing to something other than Scripture, although it's made to sound as if it's doctrine. So point number six, Revelation takes a back seat. He's not dependent on the sufficiency of Scripture, but what makes his life work. One of the great trends in our generation and the last century is pragmatism. Well, it must be of the Holy Spirit because it works. Ah, there's a lot of human viewpoint that works, but that doesn't mean it's from God or right. We have to remember point number seven, that the spiritual life is a supernatural life, and you can't ignore that, that you can only go forward because uh, and when you're walking by the Holy Spirit. And the only way to recover from sin, point number eight, is confession. If there's no confession, there's no fellowship, there's no abiding in Christ, there's no walking by the Spirit. Now, the Bible uses some other terms to describe the lukewarm believer. In Galatians 5, 4, he said to be estranged from Christ. Why? Because he's no longer walking according to principles of grace, but legalism. And so because he's operating on legalism, he has broken fellowship with Christ. In Hebrews twelve fifteen, the term that is used is he's fallen short of the grace of God, and therefore it's easy for him to get involved in mental attitude sins such as bitterness, envy, resentment. Uh, in Second Peter two seven through nine, it talks about the fact, uh, talk using Lot as an example, that your soul is tormented. There's no inner happiness. There's no inner peace. Another term that is used in, is by James in James one eight and also four eight. This is a double minded man. The word there in the Greek is disukos. Uh, talk about a, uh, multiple personalities. He is trying to operate like a Christian, but he's living like an unbeliever. And so there's an inherent instability in his thinking. The solution is given in James 4.8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. This is another metaphor for confession of sins. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the solution is to uh, return to fellowship, to confess your sins, and to get back in fellowship. Uh, and then uh, we have to recognize that it's a the lukewarm believer is a person who has a superficial form of spirituality. They may show up at Bible class frequently. They may have great doctrinal notebooks. But somewhere along the line, there's no real consistent obedience and walking by the Lord. Somewhere along the line, some people get the idea that if you emphasize obedience, you're legalistic. Well, that's not what Scripture says. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. So the solution is Revelation 3, 18. The Lord says, I can't counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Now notice this is refined gold. It's not just gold. But how do we get this? Now this isn't talking about salvation, folks. Revelation twenty two seventeen expresses salvation this way. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Uh, let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Freely. You don't buy it. 
It's free. Salvation is free. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. You don't purchase it. So we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about something you purchase, you you work for. This is indicated as well, First Corinthians 3, 12, when the judgment seat of Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation after they're saved and they're in Christ, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's what? Work. See, they're going to earn something or earn rewards with their life. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. Notice that it's purified by fire. That's when you get the refined gold. How do you buy the refined gold? By walking by the Spirit, living a life where the Spirit is producing in you the spiritual growth and the fruit of the Spirit, and that yields the result of purified gold at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.14, If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he will be saved yet as through fire. And there are rewards for those who live and walk according to the Holy Spirit. They will receive a uniform of glory. It's mentioned here, and in Revelation 3, 4, and 5, they will be given white garments, a special reward or indication of their spiritual status in heaven. In contrast, uh, the Lord says here, you, may, and you, you need to buy white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. In other words, don't walk around by, by the flesh because eventually you will become exposed in your inadequacies at the judgment seat of Christ. And then last he says, purchase ISAB. This was what was produced there in Laodicea, as we've seen in the past, that they had a, uh, a powder that was used in an ointment to heal eye problems and ear problems. And he's saying, uh, purchase, or he's saying, anoint your eyes with eye salve so you open your eyes to spiritual truth. You're not walking around in spiritual darkness and self-deception because of arrogance. So how do you get back there from being in a position of lukewarmness? And the Lord reminds them, as many as I love, and this is the Greek verb phileo, emphasizing a more intimate personal love, indicating that he is talking to believers in the royal family. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. This is Hebrews twelve seven, whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and scourges alive every son. This is divine discipline. Therefore, he says, be zealous. What does that mean? Be passionate about the word of God. Make it your priority. You folks in Laodicea haven't made it your priority. You're too busy getting distracted from coming to Bible class. You say, Bible class, once a week's enough. No, it's not. Don't fool yourself or fool God. Once a week is never going to counter the input from the worldly system around you. Three times a week isn't either. We have to get serious about the Christian life and be zealous and change. That's what repent means, change your mind. Repent means literally change your mind Quit operating on the standards and the priorities of the cosmic system around you and get serious about your spiritual life. And to do that, Christ has to be a part of your life. Verse 20, we read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's a picture of Christ outside the church wanting in because they've excluded him. They've rejected his sufficiency. They're not walking by the Spirit. They're not abiding in Christ. And he says, if, third class condition, Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if, this is the option, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. Now, how do you open the door? You confess your sin. That's how you recover fellowship. That's how you go from walking according to to the flesh to walking by the sin nature. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will what? I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What's the picture here? The picture is sitting down at a communal meal and having fellowship. See, that's the imagery that is also used of the Lord's table in Scripture. It is a time of coming together and expressing our fellowship with God. It's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But it doesn't stop with getting saved. That's the starting point. We need to have an ongoing 
fellowship and relationship and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ as the core of our spiritual life and spiritual growth. Jesus stated it in John chapter 15 that we must abide in Him or we can't produce fruit. John, I mean, Paul says it a different way. He says we have to walk by the Spirit or there won't be any spiritual growth or spiritual production. And so it's that ongoing fellowship, that ongoing communion with Christ. And that's what communion focuses on. As we celebrate the Lord's table this morning, it is a reminder of who and what we are in Christ because of who He is, the bread, and what He did, the cup. And because we accepted Him, that's that eating and drinking is a picture of accepting Christ, of bringing Him into our life. That's what we did when we put our faith in Him. When you believed Christ died on the cross for your sins, you uh, received Him into your life. But after you're saved, what happens? You still sin. So there has to be ongoing confession and recovery. That's what Revelation 3.20 is talking about. This isn't a salvation verse, folks. This is a verse talking about the fact that after you're saved, you need to let Christ be a vital part of of your ongoing Christian life. Otherwise, it is a dead Christian life. Oh, you're still going to get saved. You're still going to go to heaven, but you're going to be like those folks in 1 Corinthians 3 that at the judgment seat of Christ, everything is burned up and they're left with nothing. So this imagery of cleansing and and forgiveness goes throughout the Scripture, and that's why Paul told the Corinthians, who, of course, are very similar to the Laodiceans, that before they come to the Lord's table, before they celebrate this, they need to make sure this is a reality in their life. They need to examine themselves to make sure that they're approaching the table in right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord's table is a celebration. That's what worship is. It's a celebration of what, who Christ is and what He did on the cross for us. This is why we're to do this on a regular basis is to call us back in case we somehow we've just forgotten what the priorities are. It's to call us back to the fact that, that Jesus Christ did all of this for us and He paid for us with a price. We are bought with a price. We are His. Therefore, we are to glorify God in our body. Well, and we're going to bow our heads in just a minute and uh, I'm going to... Uh, s- transition from the close of the message into the Lord's table. And at that time, I will return thanks for the cup. And as we have our uh, heads bowed and our eyes closed, the uh, kids are going to come in from teen class and get settled so they can participate, and we will have the Lord's table. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we do thank you for our relationship with Jesus Christ, that, that you loved us in such a way that you sent your Son to die on the cross for us. Paul says that you demonstrated your love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we are reminded that we are all born dead in our trespasses and sins, but you loved us and sent your Son to take care of that problem. He paid for it in his own body on the cross. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. You cannot participate in the Lord's table and have it have any meaning unless you are first and foremost a member of the body of Christ, that you have salvation, that you have recognized that Jesus Christ is the one who died on the cross for your sins and that you have put your trust in him. At that instant, you are entered into the royal family of God and you are his forever. And then the ritual of the Lord's table has real meaning and significance for you. This is your opportunity right now. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Now, Father, we come to the bread. This bread represents the character of our Lord Jesus Christ, who he is as the God-man, the impeccable God-man who was without sin, who entered into human history as a baby and lived as a human, solving the problems in his life as we solve ours through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and yet he did not sin. Thus he was qualified as as what was pictured in the Old Testament as the lamb that was unblemished, unspotted, that he could go to the cross and die for us, that he is indeed the Lamb of God who takes away 
the sin of the world. Now, Father, we pray that as we partake of the bread, that we would be reminded of all Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.